started this morning, folks, with the first song. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his porch with praise. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he hath made me glad. He has made me glad, yes, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his courts with praise. For this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Yes, he has made me glad. I will rejoice. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, I will rejoice, and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the that comes from our Lord Jesus. It's so good to be in this house where we can praise God, we can worship Him, and we can learn from Him, and we can hear from Him. And one verse that I'd like to, to share with you as we start today, this morning, we have a wonderful day, uh, a lot of sun, but I'm not fooled because it doesn't mean it's hot. <laughs> in Africa, that look like very warm. But here it's cold. But here's a verse that I really love. Uh, Psalm 65, uh, verse 4. Uh, in the New uh, King James Version, it says, Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house or of your holy temple. Amen. Not a blessing. You came in here because he chose you. Amen. And he worked in your heart in such a way that you could not say, Amen. it's revival. You say, God, you work in my heart this morning. Thank you so much. So let's go to Come. the announcement. Let's pray. Father God, bless this offering for the use of your work. Thank you, Lord, for each one who gives today. We know, Lord, that it, it's an act of worship, our offering, a sacrifice well-pleasing to you. Bless it and use it for your glory. Minister, Lord, to those we've mentioned and, and others not mentioned but not unseen by you. Help each one with their burden. And then today, Lord, if there's anyone listening who doesn't know where their soul is destined forever, may they come to hear this gospel, receive it, believe it, and be saved today. Exhort the Christian, Lord, may we all leave today saying, it's been good.
to be in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sails on a troubled sea Ever there's a wind in my sail But I have a friend who watches over me When the breeze turns in to a gale I know the master of the wind storm make the sun to shine again I know the master of the way sometimes I soar like an eagle to the sky among the peaks my soul can be found an unexpected storm may drive me from the heights It may bring me low, but it never brings me down I know the master of the wind I know the maker of the rain He can calm the storm, make the sun shine again I know the master of the wind I know the maker of the rain He can calm the storm Make the sun to shine again I know the master of the wind wonder consider all thy worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my song
From lofty mountain grand and dark And hear the mild And feel the gentle because it's such a sad thought but a beautiful thought in what Christ did for us and when I think that God his son us buried sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my song.
There's a wonder of springtime and harvest. The sky, the stars, the sun. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that's just as the pastor comes to bring us his. Paul's latter ministry, Acts chapter 28, this morning, our last chapter in the book of Acts. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have in studying it and preaching it. We see his 
ministry on Malta, his report at Rome this morning as we conclude the book. As you're turning to Acts 28, Henry Dunant was born to wealthy parents in Switzerland in 1828. He was a privileged young man to wealthy parents, but he was deeply compassionate. He came to faith in Christ. He devoted considerable time to assisting and encouraging young people. Glad to see these young people here today. Amen. All around the room. Especially, Henry had a heart for the poor. He had a compassion that was unusual for a young, young teenager. When only about 18 years old, he founded a Young Men's Christian Union. Eventually, this sensitive person journeyed to Italy to have an audience with the Emperor Napoleon III, who was at war driving the Austrians out of northern Italy Arriving shortly after a horrendous battle in 1859, Henry couldn't believe what he saw. The picture doesn't do it justice, but arriving at the battlefield, he saw some 40,000 men wounded, dying, and dead, laid scattered over a bloody terrain for the vermin and vultures to consume. Henry, forgetting his personal agenda with the Emperor Napoleon, pitched in, got right down in the battlefield, and he did whatever he could do to help work with whatever doctors or medics who were there, it was not like it is today. Some of the Austrian doctors were uh, taken captive. They, they were left on the battlefield, people just crying out for the wounds they suffered. Henry couldn't believe it. And seeing no one helping, he organized a civilian population, especially women and children, to help the wounded soldiers, no matter what side they were on. He organized the purchase of supplies and set up makeshift field hospitals, perhaps much like Samaritan's Purse today does help in, in disaster. He wanted to help in, in battle, in war. He subsequently went back home and he, he wrote and he spoke on the horrors of war. And he worked and he worked at trying to get a neutrality to help the ones who've fallen on the battlefield, no matter what side they were on. And so in 1864, you probably heard the Geneva Convention in 1864. It convened and, and it was to consider how people are treated during war. 22 nations participated and signed accords acknowledging there should be a neutrality in medical personnel in a time of war and hostility. In 1901, Henry received the Nobel Peace Prize because... He working so hard to get this neutrality in war to help those fallen on the battlefield. He organized uh, a group that chose a red cross on a white field in a banner and symbol. And so we have the red cross. He 
Because a young man got down into the battlefield and cared about his brother. Even though they might be opposite sides. You know, wars are fought by governments. Probably not by people of the town. Read along with me Paul's ministry on Malta, verses 1 through 10. Paul's ministry on Malta, number one. Now, when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. In that region, there was a, an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us with many, in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, God, for... Paul's life, being willing to serve wherever he was, people around him. Lord, help us to want to do the same. May our lives count for Christ. Touch our hearts through your word to go and to help those who need you. Save the lost, encourage the Christian, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, in 1901, Henry, that I showed you earlier, won the Nobel Peace Prize. And it was said of him, There is no man who more deserves this honor, for it was you, 40 years ago, who set on foot the international organization for the relief of the wounded on the battlefield. Without you, Henry, the Red Cross, the supreme humanitarian achievement of the 19th century, would probably have never been undertaken. That's quite an achievement to one's life. But you know, there's a greater uh, help that we can be. Yes, those things are important and we're involved in them. We give to the Red Cross every year. We give to those who are trying to meet the needs of people. And we must ever care about people, no matter what they are or who they are, no matter where they live or whatever culture. Wherever you find yourself, may we, like Paul, have a ministry in our Malta. We see the kindness of the natives here in verses 2, 4, and 6. Kindness of the natives. 
They showed unusual kindness. Now, they're called barbarians, but everybody who didn't speak Greek was a barbarian to, in that time. They were still probably native people on an island south of Sicily a ways uh, into the Mediterranean Sea where they crash landed. <laughs> but they stayed there three months and these people reached out to them and helped them. And, and that very night they showed this kindness by building a fire and gathering sticks to, to warm their, and welcome them, you see. They warmed them and they welcomed them. And if we're really going to make an impact, we have to have the kind of attitude that Paul had. He could have said, you know, I'm, 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 I'm uh, the reason that all 276 of these people are saved uh, on this ship, on this island. He could have looked around and been, you know, wanting people to serve him. Uh, Ju Julius and, and uh, some of the others, they were, they were listening to Paul now. He, remember, he became the captain instead of the captive. But even though he was the leader of men, he still served men. You see it there? He's gathering sticks. Paul, but when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, he laid them on the fire. He's getting right down in the trenches with everybody, helping do everything. He put his hands to the work when he was on the, on the ship, throwing stuff over. He wasn't above, he was among. That's a sign of a true leader. That's a sign of a true person who's going to make an impact in other people's lives. We can't just be about our comfort. We can't just be about our prestige. We have to be about people. And so was Paul. The natives had kindness and he returned the kindness. They showed unexpected, uh, uh, unusual kindness. They said, Paul was serving like they were serving. But you know, you can be serving and doing good deeds for God. You can be a great testimony. You can be on a mission to take the gospel wherever you go, be it a, a, a native island or in the palace of, of Rome. Paul was the same wherever he went. And the, what happened to him? He got bit of a viper. The natives, when they saw that, they, they noticed that he, 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 he was bitten. And they said, justice. You see, there, there is such a thing in the world as justice. Um, it's not karma. It's not, you know, some strange thing that's a mystery. It's, it's God. If there's ever anybody who's just, it's God. Amen? Amen. But you can't judge by just appearance. It looked as though this man's a murderer. So they, they, they called him a murderer. Uh, he, you know, he's, he's a prisoner and he survived the storm and the shipwreck, but now he's bitten by a snake. And to them, it was a snake that was going to kill him. <laughs> uh, you know, they've seen this happen before. Here he is bitten of a snake and, oh, so he's a murderer. You be kind, but don't be critical. Be kind, but don't judge other people. If somebody's suffering, you don't know the reason they're suffering. And uh, we mustn't judge. We mustn't try to be over others or, or compare ourselves among ourselves. That's not wise. The natives had kindness. And Paul had condescension. The apostles' condescension. He helped gather the sticks. He, 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 he didn't get upset when they said he was a murderer. He just shook it off. He shook it off into the fire. It was probably a cold, wet night, and the snake was lethargic. When it got near the heat, it woke up and grabbed a hold of Paul. But he didn't swell up. He didn't fall down dead. Rather, God's with him. God's helping him. He didn't let what people were saying, he's, he's a murderer. He didn't let what uh, they said about him in Jerusalem bother him. And, and God blessed him, gave him favor, and gave him friends like Joseph and Daniel. We just have to gather sticks. We just have to get in and be kind. We just have to help others. Acts 20, verse 34 and 35. Yes, you yourselves know, said Paul, that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way 
by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Ask God to help you to come out of yourself. (laughs) I don't mean that in a strange way. Ask God to help you not be about yourself. Ask God for, for him to give you, as Paul said elsewhere, look every man not on his own things, but on the things of others. Ask God to give you a heart to come out and stop thinking about you and just think about those around you. And lend your hand. Get in there and help. Make a difference. You might think, oh, and it took Henry a long time before he was able to get uh, people to agree. I mean, nation against nation and wars and, and we're all, and, and we're in that same thing today, are we not? And some of the rhetoric that goes on amongst nations. No, I mean, it could destroy us all. <laughs> there was more a heart like Henry had. And where did that come from? It started in that young men's society back in Switzerland. You get involved in the things of the Lord, in the ministries that God's going to begin here. You get involved wherever you, you, you say, well, I don't have much to offer. Just pick up a stick. You say, oh, I don't have. Wasn't it just a stick that Moses threw down? And it swallowed up the snakes of the world. Wasn't it just a stick that Moses took and smote the waters and they parted so all God's people could pass over and the enemy would be swallowed up? Wasn't it just a little lad's lunch? God fed a multitude. You give God whatever it is, even if it's a cup of cold water. Ah, Thank you, Carl. (laughs) And what does the Bible say of that? You'll not lose your reward. Well, you might lose it now because I pointed you out. (laughs) It says to do all those things in secret. It does. And, And when we acknowledge it, we steal people's rewards. I won't do that no more. You give your little cup of water to the Lord, amen? You give your stick. You, bump, you gather up. You, you look around you and see what is it that you can do to add to the warmth and comfort of those around you. It was unusual kindness. And Paul condescended. Paul came down. He suffered no hurt. And then they called him a god. Much like they did the same thing in Acts chapter 14. They said he was a god and they tried to worship him there. He said, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. We are men just like you. We have to be careful that in all of our service, we, we don't let it get, go to our head. We don't, we don't want to do it for the glory of it. Because there will be glory in it. There may be a noble prize. As you try to help others, as you Bring them the gospel. They stayed on this island for three months, and I'm sure that the Apostle Paul witnessed about Jesus, and many, many are going to believe. We, we, we find the, the citizen's courtesy in verses 7 through 10. But first of all, Mark 16, 18. Here, here, here's the explanation of what happened. The Lord said this was going to happen by those who, who were serving him in that first century after uh, uh, Jesus' resurrection. There were still signs going on. Notice, they will take up serpents. <laughs> and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. The Apostle Paul, he he. he lays hands on Publius's dad who's sick of a fever and he raises him up. He heals him. And then many more people are coming out and he's putting his hands on them and praying for them. Verse 9. Many are healed on that island. And I don't think they're just healed of their physical problems. They're healed in their hearts. 
Because when you get the gospel, it, it does something even greater than open your, your physical eyes and your, and your, and your limbs are, are, are loosed to, to, to serve the Lord. Uh, it, it gives you a, a salvation. There was a, a, a leading citizen here who, who showed courtesy. In verse 7, he's a, called a leading citizen because now in verse 8, there's a laying one, sick of, of, of a fever, a, one laying sick of a fever, and then the laying on of hands. So God is, is showing that, that this is his work. He's verifying Paul's ministry. He's, he's already done miracles. He told Paul, you're going to crash on an island, and here and now he's on the island. God knows what he has in plan for your life and my life. And we, we too have to pray and seek his face and seek his will. Not judge by what we see. Uh, we're in a storm. Don't be mad at God. Be glad. For God's with you. God's doing something amongst you. He's giving you people around you. You're, you're going to have an effect on people's lives. There's people here today because other people went outside themselves and reached out to try to be a blessing to others. That's what I'm calling of us to do. We, we have a greater miracle than the, than the healing of, of bodies. We have the healing of souls and minds. You know, if we were to trace this, we, we do see that God did some great miracles, but they, they tended to kind of fade away, or maybe they just... God um, doesn't always do miracles. I mean, Epaphroditus, Trophimus, one was sick almost to death. Paul couldn't heal him. Himself, he, he was praying three times that the Lord would heal him, and he didn't get healing. And, and then Trophimus, he left in a place sick. He didn't heal him. Don't judge that you're out of God's will or that God has to heal everybody and, and that everybody's going to uh, have no problems. Rather, just keep doing kind things, getting involved in the work, staying humble. God was verifying the, the ministry of, of these apostles and the beginning of the church. God's doing a work in your life as well. And he just wants you to be laden with blessings. We, we've seen leading citizen, laying sick, a laying on of hands, a, a laden with blessings. Look at 1 Corinthians 9, 11. Here's what Paul said. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material blessings? And in verse 10, that's exactly what Publius does. You see, when God blesses you, it's not so that you could just, you know, hoard all the blessing. If God comforts you, it's not just so that you can, you know, keep all the comfort to yourself. If God does a miracle for you, it's not so that you can just gloat in yourself. No, no, God wants to bless you to make you a blessing. And that's what Publius did. They gave him, oh, look, look at it, verse 10. They provided such things as were necessary. They honored us in many ways. When God blesses you and gives you um, those blessings, be sure to share them with others. Be sure to be about others. Again, be about others. Paul's ministry on, on Malta was so received that they sent him on his way with what he needed. He was encouraged. Then lastly, Paul's report at Rome. God has a ministry for you, and he wants you to be involved in being kind and helping others. But we must make sure that the report is the report of the gospel. Remember, Paul has a mission. <clears throat> he, he was called as the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. And when the Lord appeared to him on the road, he, he, he showed him how many things, great things, he was going to have to suffer uh, for Jesus' name to get the gospel to the world. Gospel 
started at Jerusalem, but now it's, it's going to go to all the world. You are here today. This church is here today. This Bible is here today because the Apostle Paul took the gospel wherever he went, and he took it to the capital of the empire of the world. And you and I have to do the same. We have to report to the world this great gospel. Look at verses 11 through 31. Um, first of all, Paul's uh, going to get on a superstitious ship. Verse 11. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship. Remember, Alexandria is in Africa, bringing grain ships out of there whose figurehead was the twin brothers which had wintered at the island. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed there three days. From there, we circled round and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew. And the next day, we came to Batoli, where we found brethren. We're invited to stay with them seven days. <clears throat> and so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appia Forum and three inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now, when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldiers who guarded him. Why did he mention this superstitious ship? Castor and Pollux were in, um, carved in the, in the fore of the, of the ship. It's kind of ironic to me, and, and I see in it that, you know, they, they didn't listen to Paul and the other ship. It was an Alexandrian ship as well. And it went down in the storm. The ship was lost, but they were saved. Now they're getting on this other ship, and they made sure that it was this, you know, Castor Pollux. Who they were? Uh, they were twin uh, sons of the god Zeus. They were very superstitious, and, and they, they would think that if they're going off into some uncharted um, waters, that these two guys would see them safely back. <laughs> There are so many superstitions in the world, so many false religions, so many beliefs that people have, and, and um, we, we don't trust in those things. We trust in the living God. He's not a block of wood. Amen? Our God can calm the seas. He, he's, he's in control of the wind. I think he put it there to just show them, you know, that's what the world believes in. That's what the world thinks. The world judges by appearance. The world thinks you're a god or they think you're a murderer. You know, they're so fickle. The world is that way. Don't live like the world. Don't think like them. Don't, don't trust in them. You trust in your God. He'll bring you through the storm. Sometimes he'll bring you with no storm. And it won't be the twin God's son, Zeus's sons, that'll save you. It'll be God himself, the master of the sea. We see a supporting society of brethren, verses 14 and 15. They found brethren. They were invited to stay. No matter where we go in all the world, you have family in the Lord. Amen? We must always be given to hospitality. Uh, some went uh, so far and some went farther. These two cities mentioned um, the the, the three inns and the, and the other city were about, I don't know, 15, 20 miles apart. So some people went farther than others went. How far are you willing to go to bring encouragement to the man of God, to the work of God? Look at what it says again in verse 15. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. You know, sometimes your courage is drained. He had great courage when everybody else on that ship uh, was, remember that? He stood up and he said, take courage, take heart. But now he's given so much of his courage and of his heart 
that sometimes he's going to need courage. He took courage from them. He was ministered to. Paul said that, I thank God for you. You prayed for me. You helped me. He needed Publius to help him. And he was laying on hands and virtue is going out of him through the Lord to heal people. And now he's tired. He's weary. He needs help. Again, as you're living your Christian life, always be looking to, to add courage and thank God for each other. Always make your ministry always about strengthening and encouraging others. I know sometimes you feel inadequate and sometimes you feel, you know, socially awkward. <laughs> I mean, a bunch of the young people came up and they all sat right here and, and, and um, I felt nervous when they, when they were sitting there looking at me and, and, and they were going to just tell me goodbye. <laughs> yeah, and, and I wanted to encourage them to be here today and they were, and they are. So I guess I wasn't as bad of an influence as I thought I was on them. I wanted to say more, to thank them for coming and thank them for being there last night. Why is it we get so self-conscious and we miss the ministry to others? Let's ask God to help us all that we will not be so self-conscious and just be God-conscious. Just, just be willing to, to go out of your comfort zone, to get down in the battlefield and help people, to, to not judge, to not worry of who's getting credit or any of such thing. Let's just be like Paul and be about the gospel. Be willing to receive help and give help, to take courage and give courage. And notice even at Rome, verse 16, the captain of the guard, he didn't treat Paul like the other prisoners. He let him have his own rented house. Paul was able to receive friends. There's people here. He had written to the Rome, uh, in the book of Romans three years earlier. Uh, and, and now there's people who are saved. Uh, he'd never even met. And they're coming to minister to Paul. They heard he's in Rome now. They've heard this whole movement from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Now it's spread all over. Last night we watched a, a film about Tim Tebow. And in college he, he would put black under their eyes, you know, to, for the glare of the lights. And he put in that Philippians, I think, 419. And, and it's, I can do all things through Christ. And it was such a moving thing for his whole team and his university. And they went on to win championship. And then he's playing in the NFL and, and, and um, he, he wants to change it now. God moved in his heart to change the, 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 the um, verse. And he put, and, and his coach was getting kind of superstitious. Like, like uh, the twin brothers on the ship had. Oh, don't, don't change it. I mean, we're winning. We're winning because you're putting this goop on your eye and writing a verse. No, that's not why we're winning. And so he decided, God told him, put John 3.16. John 3.16. And, and he told his coach, I'm going to do that. And at first the coach says, no, no, don't change anything. If, if you're wearing long socks, everybody wears long socks. <laughs> he said, okay, all right. So he consented. Because Tim really believed it was God's will. And so they came out and everybody's going, John 3, 16. And, and sure enough, they went on and they, they won the, 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 the playoff game. They won. And when Tim comes out, one of the representatives says, you, do you know what happened? He goes, well, no. What do you mean? We won. Yeah, great. No, do you know what happened? And come to find out, I wish I'd have written down all the stats that there was, I should have wrote it down. It was so wonderful. But all the stats were 316. Yards, 316. Passes, 316. 316. And 93 million people Googled during the game. What is John 316? And they read, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I tell you, only God can make every one of those statistics come out. Three, one, six. Three, one, six. Only God could do that. Last night in the teen group, it was so cool. First time I'd ever seen it. I'm telling you today, God will use your life. God will help you to be a testimony to this great gospel. He will help you to reach out with your life in the gospel. Romans 12, 13 and 1 Peter 4, 9. Just be distributing to the needs. Just be given to hospitality. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then we see a summary of the so-called sect. He's making a report, a summary of this. They called this Christianity a sect. There was a sect of the Pharisees, the sect of the Sadducees, and then they called this Christianity a sect. It's not, but here's what he said in verse 17 through 22. It came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, they said to them, Men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go, because there was no cause. He said, I've done nothing. He said, there's no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called you to see you and speak with you because, notice, here it is, his, his report. For the hope of Israel, I'm bound with this chain. Then they said to him, We've neither received letters from Judea concerning you or have any brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, Christianity, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So when they happened, or when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging to whom he explained, solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning until evening. Some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed. After Paul had said one word, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our father, saying, and he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9 and 10, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. Why? For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. They have closed. Mark that. They have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Therefore, says Paul, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great dispute among themselves. And then Paul dwelt two whole years, two whole years in his own rented house and received all, received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no one forbidding him. He had done nothing to cause death. It was for the hope of Israel, the gospel of the kingdom He's going to take this gospel, and I'm not close with this. He's going to take this gospel now, not of 
the kingdom that's yet to come. Israel's going to experience a kingdom. We, we studied prophecy. We know there's coming a literal kingdom to the planet with Jesus ruling from Jerusalem. And we know that day is coming. It's after the tribulation. It's after a, a, a great uh, conflict and judgment. But now we're living in the age of the church and the gospel is going into all the world. They've been set aside. Israel is set aside and God's working through the Gentiles, all the churches of the world, to get the gospel that Jesus is the Savior. He lived, born of a virgin and never sinned. He died and he rose again. And that's the gospel of the kingdom, the church. And that's what we're to be doing, spreading this word. We see the solemn testimony from the scriptures in verses 23 through 27. Much like the two on the road to Emmaus, remember them? Jesus explained who the Messiah was from Moses and the prophets. Now Paul is doing the same with these Roman um, Jews, and these Roman um, citizens. He's telling them about the gospel of the kingdom. Explaining all the Old Testament that Jesus has fulfilled. And then he comes to the verse uh, 26. Jesus used the same verse. Some believe and some are hardened. You remember the story? And this is just the last bit here. When, when God was leading his people out of Egypt, were you ever surprised at how many times God hardened Pharaoh's heart? We also have Jesus teaching in parables, and he uses the same passage in Isaiah that Paul uses here, that people's, people are hardened. People's eyes are, are blinded, as it were. Why is that? Is that because God wants you to be saved and somebody else to not be saved? No. It's because people close their eyes. People harden their heart. You go back and read the story of Pharaoh. He hardened his heart first. But as you harden your heart, as you don't let God use your life, as you're all about you and, and your comforts, as you... Uh, live like the whole rest of the world. You, you're you're, you're going to harden your heart against what God can do and wants to do. And at some point, if you continue, he that hardeneth his neck shall what? Suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. We have to always make sure when God softens our heart that, that we respond, not with just feeling, but with action. That we get involved in getting closer to God and getting the gospel out for God. The Jews, they had, they had hundreds of years, 700 years they had of preparing for Jesus to come in the, well, longer than that, but from Isaiah 6 until when Jesus showed up. And now they're hardened. Their, their eyes are closed. They, they closed them. They stopped their ears at a few times when Jesus was preaching. Remember, they stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear it. Oh, Christian. Oh, oh lost person. Unsaved person. There will be a day when you won't be able to hear what God wants to say. And so it is. We've got to be careful that we are ever sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans eleven twenty five 25 and Luke 21, 24. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And Jesus told them, about the end times in Luke 21, 24, he said, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. God has set Israel aside and now he's working through the church. 
He's working through the Gentiles to get this gospel to Rome and, and all the world. And that's our job. We're to get the gospel out. And the reason God has blessed this church is because we have a heart to get the gospel out. And we do that by sending missionaries and monies. But oh, listen, Christian, there's a mission field around you. There's a battlefield around you where there are many who are dead or dying. And we need to help them and get involved and put our hand to it. Yes, you may get bit. Yes, you may be called a murderer and then a god. Yes, there may be all kinds of things that will be op opposition to you, but you'll have believing brothers who will support you. You'll have a mission to the, to the world of getting the gospel out. And Paul had a ascending of salvation to the Gentiles, verses 28 through 31. Ascending of salvation to the Gentiles. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. He fulfilled his ministry. Two whole years, many people come and hear the gospel. As a matter of fact, he's chained up with guards. And they're getting saved. He's having some of Caesar's family come and listen to him. And they're getting saved. And now the gospel is going to get on a ship and come to America. And we're here today because Paul was in Rome that day. Look at Philippians 1 and Philippians 4. And then we close. But I want you to know, brethren, the things which happened to me. What things? His arrest, his shipwreck, all the stuff that happened to him. All the things, being chained and, and being in, in prison and being in house arrest and all everything that's happened to me has actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident in the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. He wrote to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 22, all the saints greet you, especially, notice, especially, especially those who are of Caesar's household. Those are people that got saved in, in Caesar's household. Because the Apostle Paul, no matter what happened to him, he's going to take this gospel to the world. In conclusion, during Paul's detainment, he wrote Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. He was released from this prison experience, this house arrest. He was released for a couple of years, and he wrote, and he visited some churches, and he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus, but then he was rearrested. Again, and from prison, he wrote 2 Timothy before he was executed in 67, 68. You know, the lost world is always looking at things in superstition and superficially. But God is our only hope and salvation. Jesus is the prophesied one to come and bring salvation. And as you and I believe God and serve him in taking the gospel to the world, through the word of God, through our faithful lives, through kindness and good deeds to all, without judgment, God will bless. God will protect you. God will keep you in this wicked, wicked world. Matthew 28, 20, lo, I am with you. How long? Even until the end of the world. Oh, may people turn to God in faith, lest he harden those who turn away in unbelief. Let's pray. Lord, help us that we would have a ministry among the, the barbarian. On the, on, on, Lord, where you take us, May, may we not be acting better than others. May our experience be like Paul, where we just serve each other. Like this Henry, who cares not about who's winning the battle, but cares about the fallen. Give us a heart for those around us, Lord, who are wounded, for those who are lost. Lord, give us a, 
a desire to take the gospel. And, and, and Lord, help us to know that it's a dangerous thing to resist the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to not just know the truth, but to live the truth. With your head bowed and your eye closed, just for a moment, it's our invitation. Do you know for sure where your soul's going to spend forever? The Bible says that our, our, our real being, our, our soul is eternal. And it'll go to heaven or hell. We're born sinners and our destiny is with the devil, with the world, with hell, going to hell. But God, he's just. And he has to enact the punishment. But he is also kind merciful, forgiving. He became a man to take the place of mankind. If you're, if you're going to be saved, you have to, first of all, confess to God you're a sinner, that you've broken his holy law. The Bible says to break it one point, you're guilty of it all. But that's why Jesus never sinned and he died for your sins. He's God in the flesh, never sinned, paid for yours when he died. And he rose up that body of his own power. He rose up the body of Jesus. Just pray this prayer. If you want to be saved, say, God, I confess I'm a sinner. Thank you that you died for me in Jesus and rose again. Come into my heart. And wash me with your blood. Cleanse me of my sins. Save my soul. Lord, I pray somebody prayed that, meant that, and will get a hold of us and let us know how we can help them, Lord, to grow in this walk of God, this life of God in them. And help us as believers, Lord, that we wouldn't be about ourselves, but about each other. And look for ways to put our hand, to, to lend you what we have, even if it's just a stick, just a cup of water, just a little lunch. You'll do great things if we'll just get out of the way and let you live the way in us. Bless this church, Lord, as we go forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, if you made a decision for the Lord, we have some free gifts for you, a, a little booklet on seven steps to joy, the basic steps in the Christian life. We'll get you one of those and also somebody assigned to you to help you if you'd like that. And then uh, a New Testament with Bible studies in it, some other pamphlets of baptism and putting God first in your life. We trust that you'll be out there seeing what you can do to help those around you in kindness, not criticism or judgment. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Shake hands with uh, one another and visitors. Thank you, Dave.